you can turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. We are going to continue, as John said, pointing along in the Gospel of Mark together. Remember, Mark is a Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, telling us the history of his life and all that it means for us. While you turn there, So for quite a few years, I was a secondary school teacher in the States. I, I actually trained in science education. I taught chemistry for several years. And one of the ways God designed our amazing universe is by using different types of bonds to hold our physical world together. You didn't know you were going to get a chemistry lesson today, <laughs> did you, when you came to church? Chemical bonds, uh, like in a piece of wood, you know, there are different elements like carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, and they're, they're held together by chemical bonds. We've got nuclear bonds that hold together the, the center of an atom of the nucleus. You've got protons and neutrons that hold those pieces of matter together. In those bonds are, are hidden a lot of energy. We see this when we burn some fireworks or when we drive our cars, when we heat our homes. So there's power when those and you get fire. You see that even to a greater degree when you think about bombs and a lot of chemical power coming out for a period of time. You probably see it to, to, the, to the top degree when you think about a, a nuclear explosion, or the power of our sun <coughs> as it blazes out in our solar system. <coughs> Often, we don't have power though, don't we? You know, when you're writing with a pencil, you're not necessarily thinking, there's a lot of power in this pencil. You're, you know, you're, you're just using it, you're just using it to write. You're just what you do with a pencil. Uh, this is sometimes how we can feel when it comes to the gospel and the power of the gospel in our own hearts and in our lives. We might live our Christian lives, we read our Bibles, and we pray, and we, we come here on a Sunday morning, Bible study on Friday, but we forget. Same thing like me, we just forget. Power in itself it has inherent power to change your heart and to change my heart. Yet, as Jesus begins his ministry, as we'll see, there's a paradox here when it comes to the power that we see in the gospel. Look at verses 14 and 15. Chapter 1. It says, Now after John Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God fulfilled in the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Do you notice the paradox? John's arrested and Jesus, and he was a forerunner to Jesus. And they're baptized. And they, they're coming because they want to confess their sins and have forgiveness. And Mark just kind of said, yeah, he's arrested, and then you've got good news. And you're like, wait a minute, John's arrested. What, where is the good news in that? What is, this, what is this message of the kingdom of God that Jesus is proclaiming? And so you see, there would have been some tension here in this scene. There would have been some tension. Jesus is saying that something's coming, something's here, and it's good. <laughs> And yet, John's arrested is a paradox. And that is the upside-down, inside-out kingdom of God. This is the already-not-yet kingdom of God that we see in the Bible and that we see today. John's arrested, yet there's good news. There's, there's hardship and there's glory, and they sit side by side. Where is this kingdom? Some may have been asking that very question. Where is the kingdom of God? You say there's power. 
There's good news, but where is that? We might ask that same question. Has God's kingdom really come in Jesus? It's been 2,000 years. There's been countless wars, countless plagues. We're in the middle of two renditions of those right now, plagues and war. Where is this kingdom? Does God reign? Is Jesus on a throne? Is there any power in this book to do anything? Maybe we're too comfortable to notice God's rule and reign. Typically, in, in this country at least, not everyone, but we live pretty comfortable lives. Maybe we think that we just are reigning in our, in our own lives. And we forget that there may be someone reigning above us. Or maybe we're just too busy to even think about and notice the work of God among us. Or in our own hearts. But when we do stop and remember the reign of Jesus, and we have those moments where we're like, yes, Jesus is on his throne. But do you ever feel like you're alone in that realization? Jesus is on his throne, but nobody else seems to think that. You can barely hold on to your belief that what you believed has power. The sad thing is if we're blind to the power of the gospel and the work of God, we forget that that power is in the cross. The cross is the very instrument that gives the gospel power. This is the upside-down, inside-out kingdom of God. It's life through death. It's strength through weakness. It's freedom. You want freedom? It's through surrender. It doesn't make sense to the world. Remember in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says that the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Paul says in Romans that he's not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Do you believe in the power of the cross? We should not live the Christian life with like this defeatist mentality, right? A, a woe is me, I'm just surviving kind of existence. That's not what God has for us. Because just like the first century people saw miraculous results of Jesus' presence in their community, so can we. <coughs> I want to challenge you this morning to live with the hope that the gospel message is powerful. That there actually is something that the gospel message is doing, and that Jesus is at work among us even today. I want to show you four of reality that show that the gospel message can actually give you hope today in its power. So you can drop your anchor this morning into the raging seas of life, and you can know that the gospel message still calls people to a radical life of faith. It still does that. Look here in chapter 1 and verse 16. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he, that's Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of si Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you I will, I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going out a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and follow him. Jesus calls others to follow. But the interesting thing is that Jesus is always going in a different direction than we were when he calls us. He's always going a different direction. And so he's calling these men to follow, but there's a huge cost here. They're leaving. And in today's world, of opportunity, that might not seem like a monumental change. We kind of have, you know, families who leave, 
other places and you kind of move around. But this is a massive calling on these men's lives. All that was familiar to them. All that brought in money and, and thus what brought in their food was put into question when Jesus says, follow me. So following Jesus is, is, un, is an unpredictable life. It's a risky life from, from our viewpoint. The false pillars of control that we love. Don't you love control? Don't you love to have control of your life? But when we follow Jesus, those are just like knocked under. And those pillars fall down. Because we realize, I don't have control. I am not ultimately in control of my life. They thought, in this moment before he called them, they thought they knew their futures a bit. I'm, I'm going I'm to fish, might raise a family, pass a business on, keep fishing, kind of do my thing. Jesus changes that completely. This is the exciting life of a Christ follower. Each day is an adventure of the unknown. But you know what? There's, there's hope because even though there's unknowns for us, we know the one who knows. We know the one who actually has planned the future. Maybe Jesus is calling you to that life today. You'll know it when you can't help but obey it. That's like these, these men. They immediately dropped what they were doing. They could not resist following Jesus. And maybe today your, is the day that your path changes forever and the direction that you were headed changes and now suddenly you're heading in the direction that Jesus is heading. Jesus is still calling people today. And he called them to a purpose. Did you notice? He doesn't just say, hey, walk with me. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to change your job and your purpose in this life. And if you, if you notice something about a fisherman, a fisherman changes the life of a fish forever. That fisherman, that, they catch that fish. It's no longer in the water. They're no longer swimming around doing their thing. And that is what Jesus is calling these men to be. And that is what our purpose is. It's gloriously simple, but it's divinely empowered. We make disciples, and we teach them to obey Jesus. If you're following Jesus today, that's your, that's your purpose. That's your purpose. This is what every Christian in history has been called to do. And, and if you're a Christian here this morning, it's because somebody obeyed that. It's because somebody obeyed that, and they told you about Jesus. And Jesus saved you, and now you're following him. <coughs> the purposes of your money, your time, your vacation, your family are all now under the kingship of heaven. There's no sphere of life that should escape the impact of the gospel in your life. And this is not just to, to leaders. Th these men weren't like the pillars of their community. They were just fishermen. And most of the apostles were really nobodies. They were just people. Ordinary people like you and me. This is not just a call on some high level of Christianity. It's a call on all of God's children. He repurposes our lives. Remember your own story? Whether, you're, whether you were one step away from hell, what it felt like, or, or whether you grew up in, in, a, in a Christian God-fearing home where you read the Bible, one way or the other, if you're trusting in the blood of Jesus and the power of the cross to save you from your sin this morning, you are a beautiful, walking, breathing example of the power of God to repurpose someone's life. That is what Jesus is still doing today. Look at your own story. Think about where you could have been and where you are now. That is what Jesus is doing. We forget. Don't let me forget. We just plug along in the Christian life and we realize, by God's grace, we are the children of God. And we're in a new family. And so he doesn't just call them, he doesn't just call them to purpose, he also calls them to community. These men, 
Simon, and Simon is Peter, Simon, Peter, Simon, and Andrew, James, and John, they're going to be together in this world forever. They'll live in different places, but they'll be family. And not just in this world, but for all eternity, they will be together. And so the, he's calling them to a new community. And you know, the, the church should be our base of community. This should be our base of fellowship. Here we should find fellowship and forgiveness, like-mindedness, joy, encouragement, accountability. For, for many of us, and even in this room, the church is our family. My family is 4,000 miles away. <coughs> I don't have any blood in this country. They're 4,000 miles away. So who else do I have but you? Who else do I have but you? I need you to be my family. That's the community that God has called us into. I need you to love me when I fail, because I will. I need you to serve me when I'm weak. I need you to ask me how I'm doing. I need you to spend time with me. I need you to get down and talk to my kids and disciple them. Like their grandparents might, but they're not here. How do we do that? Friday, or when we're gathering for a picnic next week. There's not pressure. There should be no guilt. It's just that this, this is family. This is the community that God has given us. And I think another way to cultivate community is spending time with each other away from here. Have a cup of coffee. Go for a walk. Have people in your home. It doesn't have to be family. Like, have, put the kettle on. <laughs> You know what it was, was new for me? I've never, I've never seen anywhere in Ireland is, is someone <coughs> just wants a cup of hot water. That's a new one for me. I'm from Florida. We try to avoid hot things, period. And so, like, you just want a cup of hot water? That's easy! <laughs> you just turn the kettle on and have someone over and you can have your hot water or your tea. It, it, it's easy. It is easy to be together. And I think we should cultivate that. Because God is still at work in the hearts of people, but we have to be with people to see it. We have to get to know people to see that God's at work. Because you can't just chat for a minute about the weather and know that God's at work. We need to be in each other's lives. Because God still is, Jesus is doing something. He's calling and transforming hearts today. Just like he did here. So not only can we hope that the gospel is still calling people to radical faith, but you know what? The gospel still has authority over our enemies of sin and evil. Jesus still has authority over that. Look in verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribe. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? And even the unclean spirits, and they obey him? And at once, his fame spread everywhere, throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Why were they astonished? As authority. He was teaching like one who had authority. And the illustration of this authority cries out in the middle of the synagogue. <laughs> this demon-possessed man is sitting among them in the synagogue. And he cries out, and there's fear. Do you see the fear? Will you destroy us? There's probably some reverence there, too, from these, these demons. I would imagine there's some fear. With a few words, Jesus sends them away. He has power over evil. Why does he silence the demons? It's 
couple different views on that. I, I think he silences the demon because who would want the testimony of a demon? Like, would, would that be the credible testimony that you'd want that you're the Holy One of God? The, the demon? <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think I would. I wouldn't believe much demon says. And so I, I think part of the reason is, don't speak about me. I don't need your testimony. True or not, it's a true statement. <coughs> Jesus didn't, didn't need it. Does the world feel overrun by evil to you? Does the world feel like there's just so much wrong all the time? No hope, there's war, hunger, deception, sexual morality, just running rampant? Where's the justice? Where's the righteousness? Where's the holiness? Brother and sister, Jesus is still on his throne over those things. Just like we see here, he is still on his throne. Even the darkest day of all history, when the Lord Jesus Christ himself died, it looked like evil was winning, didn't it? Jesus himself died on the cross. His disciples fled, didn't know what to do. It looked like evil was winning. Except the exact opposite was true. It was the death blow to sin and death and evil. This is the upside down, inside out kingdom of God. And we need eyes to see it. And this is true for us today. The evil around us, it will end. My microphone's making noise. It will end. This evil will end. And it's happening today. You know, there are people fighting for babies in the womb. There are. Some battles are lost, but there's a fight. Marriage is attacked constantly, but praise God for marriages that last a whole lifetime. War is still a reality. We know that. Very keenly right now. And yet, there are so many that do live in peace. This world could be a whole lot worse. Jesus has authority over these things. And we have to remember that he is keeping things at bay. If we were left to our own devices, this world would be hell. He still has authority. He has authority over your own struggles for sin. Not just over the world and the evil that's out there, but the evil that's in here. He has authority over that. Because in Christ, brother and sister, you no longer are a slave to sin. It is no longer your master. Paul says in Romans, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So in Christ, as your new master, you can say no. To sin. You can say, stop. You can have victory over your anger and your lust and your greed and your selfish ambition. And then Paul says in Galatians, you can actually walk in the spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. You are commanded to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And you actually can. We can actually be those people. Who are living out the fruits of the Spirit. Because Jesus has power over the sin in your own heart. Coming. Fully in the future. The gospel still has authority over us. And the gospel message still heals our infirmities. It still does. Look at verse 29. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many 
who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. My dad, Kevin, he died in 2019 at the age of 69. He had been on kidney dialysis for 12 years. He had congestive heart failure. His hearing was terrible. His teeth were terrible. He had gout, which causes pain in the joints. He rarely slept the whole night. He had really bad post-traumatic stress from his time in the Vietnam War. He also had pretty amazing joy in Jesus. His sins were forgiven and that he fully healed, restored body one day. My dad longed for a new body. His was so broken. You can feel that. One day his healing will complete when his body is resurrected from the dead. He will have his new body. Jesus is still healing our infirmities. Our bodies are amazing. Intimacy, eyesight, hearing, circulation, our memories, they fail. They fail. We're broken. We need healing. You know, we're embodied creatures. So our bodies do matter. We're not just souls that happen to be in a body. And God has made us to be embodied souls. And we will always have a body. We're not in this trap there. And in this passage, Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And then he heals many who are sick and many who are demon-possessed. Because he has power to do that. That's who Jesus is. And he still has that power today. Physical healing can be true for us today, but we have to think of this in the short and the long term. In the short term, Jesus might heal your ailments, your cancer, your migraines, infertility. But, but he might not. Even in this account, he just says many were healed. It doesn't say everybody was healed. And that's true as you read the gospel. Not everyone in all of Jerusalem and Judea and all that. Like, that's not like everybody suddenly had no ailments. Jesus can do that. But he doesn't always. In the long term, though, for his people, he will heal all your infirmities. All of them. The ones that you know you have, the ones that you don't know that you have, any of the ones that you could possibly have. You will have a perfect body. Can you imagine? Our broken bodies, like imperfection? It's hard to imagine. I feel like mine's a mess. I'm not even that old, <laughs> but I still feel like I'm a mess. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. Jesus is still healing today. It's not always what we think it should be, but we're not on the throne. I don't know what it should be. He also gives us spiritual healing. He's casting out demons in this section. He's cleansing evil from within. And when you trust in Jesus, that's what he does for you. In the short term, like I already said, you can have victory over your sin. In the long term, you will be forever free from the penalty, power, and presence of sin. Because today, sin is your greatest infirmity. No matter what your body feels like today, sin is your greatest infirmity. That needs to be removed, or you cannot stand in the presence of God. But one day soon, for his people, you'll never be tempted again. You'll never get angry again. You'll never lust again. You'll never be hurt by someone else again. That's what Jesus promises to do. 
We see the hope of the gospel is real today. You don't need to fear sickness or death. In Christ, those things are temporary. Do you expect Jesus to call people to himself? Do you expect Jesus to exercise his authority over evil? Do you expect Jesus to heal people? We should have this hope today. We should have it right now. Finally, you should have an eager expectation that the gospel still impacts communities. It really does still impact communities. Look at verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him, and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I might preach there also, for that is why I came. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, and casting out demons. Then a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. Why do we plan to church and pass it? Why not just grow the church in Douglas that we branched off from? Or for that matter, it comes in. Why do we plan to church and pass it? Well, we see Jesus going to different towns. We see Paul going to different towns and Barnabas going to different towns. We go into communities with the gospel and we expect the gospel to transform those communities. That's what we expect. Jesus went out to pray and the disciples were searching for him. And actually, the, the word there, like in desperation, where is Jesus? He's trying to be by himself. And they're desperately looking for him. And they say that in verse 37. Everyone's looking for you, but Jesus' response is interesting. He says, okay, well, let's go on. Everyone's looking for me. But they say, let's go on. Why? Why would he do that? He wants to preach there also because that's why he came. He came to transform communities. He, this community had experienced some transformation of Jesus, and so he's going to the next community. Jesus always has capacity for more. There's always capacity for more. There's always capacity for more churches. Do you think one church, okay, in passage, is going to serve the 6,000 people that live here? There's always capacity for more. And communities are not just generic groups of people, are they? Communities are individuals. And, and we see this beautiful example of an individual here in this leper. This leper that has been impacted by the teaching of Jesus. But he's, he's sadly he's excluded from community because you see to have leprosy in this day was to be completely isolated. And completely excluded. You're alone, kind of worthless, without purpose. Think what this man is asking of Jesus. Think about what he's doing. He's like, who can do that? Jesus can do that. Because he transforms communities one person at a time. One person at a time. Immediately, this man went from unclean to clean because Jesus touches the untouchable. He touches the untouchable, and this man is then able to be welcomed back into community. I know it's a physical healing heal, but, but Mark wants us to see something. He wants us to see this picture of Jesus inviting sinners back into community. So even if you feel like you've done everything wrong, Jesus wants you to run to him. And he will make a way for you to be back in community. Because that's what Jesus came to do. 
is to preach and to save the lost. This is exactly the rescue that Jesus brought to me. I was alone, lost, and hopeless at eight years old. I didn't maybe know the depth of that fully. But he gave me eternal life, an eternal family, a purpose, and a hope in heaven. Why would we put a church in passage? Because we should believe that the gospel still impacts communities today, and it can impact this community. The addict in passage should not just be free from drugs, but can actually be free from the wrath of God. The liar in passage cannot just start speaking truth, but can, she can actually know the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. The selfish person in passage can actually become selfless. The lonely in passage can be known by God, a child of God. The legalist in passage can actually know of grace is and start to extend grace. This community needs Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. We need to be like this leper and honor our knees and crying out in desperation, if you will, cleanse me. And Jesus will. And this is an example of that. We can easily fall into the notion that the power of Jesus ascended with him. Do you know that? We can think, I, I haven't seen him face to face. The power of Jesus is ascended with him. I don't see it today. But let's be a church that excitedly, eagerly, and regularly reminds each other that the power of Jesus is here now. He's reigning on his throne now. He's calling people now. He's overcoming evil now. He's healing people now. And he's transforming communities now. It may be slow, and you'll be sure to be hard. But it's also true. It is also true. The power of God continues through His Word and by His Spirit. And it always will. So the return makes things fully all right. And that, and that not yet part of the kingdom becomes reality. I'm going to reread what Ruth read the last bit here. It says, in 2 Corinthians, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day to glory beyond all comparison. We look not to the things that are seen, to the things that are unseen. But the things but the things that are unseen are eternal. Church, let's have eyes for the eternal. Because Jesus is at work with us. And we can have hope in that. We can rest our hope in the fact that Jesus is still at work today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gospel that is real, that is powerful today. We thank you that the gospel is still calling. Jesus is still calling people. Maybe he's calling someone today, Lord. Maybe right in this day, the Lord Jesus is calling someone to follow him. May this be the day that they follow him. God, thank you that, that Jesus still has authority over the evil in my Thank you that he still heals and will fully heal his people with it. We thank you for still transforming communities. And God, would this community, would all with this community be followers of Jesus? Would you do a mighty work that we can only sing your praise? Help us not to lose hope. We ask in